Thank you, Aiki. Are you ready for a sermon today? Yes. All right, buckle your seatbelt and uh, we're going to fly. <laughs> because we have a very important event after this, and that's the open house. And I really pray, you know, this morning I woke up to pray for you all, asking the Lord will move all your hearts, that this is a precious season for us to invite our friends. Let's commit this time to the Lord. Father, we want to thank you for this morning. What an honor and privilege that we can come and worship you. And especially this season of Christmas, we can come so freely to celebrate Christmas and to sing carols, Lord. But yet we know that many parts of the world, in fact, we just got news that there are people in India, their house was burned down because the radicals have came in and destroyed them. We have heard pastors, Lord, who are appealing against laws that is unjustly accused against them, Lord. But yet, God, these people never, never falter in their faith. And I pray, God, that for us who have the joy and the comfort of worshipping you freely, we will not take this for granted, but that as according to your word and the announcement made, Lord, blessed are the peacemaker. May we all be called the sons and the daughters of the Most High God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Uh, brother Aiki has shared, right, uh, two weeks, two weekends ago, Pastor Mike started off, kicked off the sermon series. Uh, Jesus came to give us hope. Are you all more hopeful? I hear some nervous laughter. Last weekend, Pastor Tan came and, and shared that Jesus came to give us more joy. I think I can see some joy, a lot of smiling faces. So I believe there's a lot of joy. But do you know that uh, when you have hope, you have joy? If we have joy, you have hope. Amen. Amen? And today I'm honored to come and share with you, Jesus came to give us peace. And yet and again, these three things are interconnected. You have hope, you have joy, you have joy, you have peace. You have peace, you have joy, you have joy, you have hope. You have all, because all this are in the bundle of a Christmas gift. The gift is Jesus. If you have Jesus in your heart today, you have that joy. Can I see a show of hand? How many of you can do with more peace this Christmas? Okay. All right. Uh, lift, lift, lift your hand, lift your hand. You know, you can do with more peace. All right, I want you to pay attention to those who did not put up their hands. That means they are very peaceful people. You can share your burden with them. Pass some troubles to them. All right? <laughs> Many of them did not put up their hands. You can pass your burden to them. You know, people will go at length to find peace in their life. Uh, most people will define peace as an absence of troubles. But what peace really is, is something that I love to attempt to answer you today. And there are people who try to empty their mind and go into a seclusion, isolation, to a place, mountainous area, just hoping to get away to find peace. But how many of us, if we are honest to ourselves, we know that it is impossible. Whether we empty our mind or go into isolation, we can never find peace through all this means. Because the only peace that we can find is through Jesus. Why? Because His name is called the Prince of Peace. And when Jesus says Shalom, you must understand, He is not offering a hello, just all. He is offering Himself to all of us. Um, and if we were to look at Merriam Webster Dictionary, uh, the definition of peace, it says here, freedom from disquieting or oppressive thoughts or emotion. But we know that in life, unfortunately, there will be times we will face with disturbing thoughts, trials and tribulation. What about Cambridge? Freedom from war and violence, especially when people live and work, and pay attention to this, especially when people live and work together happily without disagreements. Now, how many of you are working? Working adults, most of you, right? Your office have politics? Have, right? Many, many are nodding your heads. When there is politics, there is no peace. You know, so if we base on Cambridge definition of peace, or, you know, Merriam Webster Dictionary, we realize that if we sought after peace according to the world definition, we will never, never have peace. In fact, there was a, a publishing by New York Times uh, based on 3,400 years of human history. And they will study the wars in this last 3,400 years. And how they define is this. If in that particular war, there is a minimum of 1,000 deaths. All right, you, you're with me? 1,000 deaths, that is considered a major war. 
And based on 3,400 years, less than 1,000 deaths. That means if there's a war or there's a, uh, unrest within a, within a community or a country, but the number of deaths is 999 and below. It's not counted in this uh, statistical study. So if there is 1,000 deaths, based on 3,400 years of human history, there are only 268 years of peace. Friend, that's only 8%. Can you imagine if I were to lump in those times where, you know, in the United States where they are shooting in the university while there are a couple of students got killed, it's definitely less than, you know, 50 perhaps, or less than 10 for some. But it kind of sent a tremor throughout, not just within the American community, but also throughout the world itself. If we were to include that, I'm very certain that it will be less than 8%. Friend, what peace are we talking about? Last Sunday, when Pastor Tan uh, shared about the joy, and he quoted from Luke chapter 2, verse 8 to 14, and his particular verse that he cited was in verse 10, then the angels said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which will be to all people. And continuing with that thought, this was one angel that came and declared to the shepherd who was watching the flock by night, and continuing from there now, it came a host, a, a host of angels. In fact, not just angels, but heavenly hosts came. And now continuing with their greetings in verse, in verse 14, it says, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill to men. Now, my question for you, my friend, do you have peace on your earth today? I'm talking about your earth now your life, your family, your marriage, your health, your work, your financial situation, do you have peace on your earth today? And today we want to dis discover what peace really is. And if you were to look at this, you know, when Jesus was born, it is not peaceful at all. Herod the Great was, was ruling at that time. And if you know the history of Herod the Great, he is one of the most insecure men. In fact, he kills all his, wife, uh, uh, his children because he's afraid that you know, the children will dominate his throne. And not only that, he killed his wife. He has one particular favorite wife. And because of insecurity, he killed his favorite wife. And after that, he felt sorry about it. You know how many women here feel very sweet about that? After, after you got killed, your husband feels sorry. I mean, not sweet at all, isn't it? And this is Herod the Great I'm talking about. And because he was so insecure and he knew that Jesus is about to be born, he wants to kill Jesus. And when he was unable to discover where he is, where he was at the time, and, uh, you know, he slaughtered the male child at the time. And because of that, Joseph and Mary, the earthly parents, have to run away to Egypt to hide. No peace at all. But why did the angels, the host of angels say, peace on earth? And this is the greatest news for us in this Christmas season, that we do not look at the circumstance over our life to find peace. If you were to follow the dictionaries, we will never have peace. But do you know what? Our greatest peace, the perfect peace that we can find, is only found in the perfect Savior, which is our Jesus Christ today. And this is what I pray, that today we will walk away and find this divine and perfect peace, even though you may not have peace today. So it doesn't matter what circumstance you are. It could be a health situation. It could be your relationship, your children, and between you and your wife and you and your husband. Friend, there is hope. There is hope because Jesus, Jesus came and gave us peace this Christmas. Let me give you the roadmap for today's sermon. I will attempt to answer two questions. What peace really is and how to pursue peace. And if you can, join me as I give you the big idea for today's sermon, um, an idea that if you forget all that I say today, hopefully you will remember this. And that throughout our lives, we will pursue peace by this. Will you read with me the next uh, slide here? One, two, three. Pursue peace through works of righteousness and pursue righteousness by becoming a peacemaker. So what peace really is the first question i like to attempt to answer is you see peace can only found in two elements or two components unless we have peace with god and the peace of god 
You see, peace with God is a one-time decision. But the peace of God is a daily pursuit. It's a pursuit that we will have to strive. And many of us will think that, oh, okay, we have Jesus, then we have peace with God. Why am I still lack of peace? Yes, because peace of God requires us to have a daily pursuit. Think with me about the story of the prodigal son. I mean, he squandered his father's money, he took his, his possession, and he ran away you know, to a remote place and he squandered all his money. In that sense, his peace with his father was severed because of that. And when he came back to his senses after feeding pigs and, and you know, uh, you know, hungry, and he decided to go back and to seek forgiveness and reconciliation. In fact, he did not even think of reconciliation, but instead of being, uh, you know, just go and be employed as a servant. But uh, because of the, the, the Father's mercy, which spoke of our Heavenly Father's mercy, when the son went back, he restored the peace with his father. He restored the peace with his father. Now, the challenge is this. You just imagine, uh, you know, in a sanctified imagination with me. This story continues to go on. After the father restored his relationship with the son and the son with the father, but the son continued to sin against the father. The son continued to just squander his life uh, back to square and continue to sin against the father. Do you think that he will have peace of the father? No. That distinction, it has to be very clear in our mind. We establish our peace with God by receiving Jesus in our life as our personal Savior and Lord and become a Christ follower. But yet, in order for us to have the peace of God, we must follow and obey the Word of God. This is the distinction. In fact, Romans 5, verse 1 and 2, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we are all born sinful. Some of us this morning here, you may not have known Christ yet. And you, you are just trying to understand perhaps during this Christmas season, what, what is this peace with God is all about? And I want to offer you this idea that we all are sinful. How many of your parents here teach your children to sin? Can I see your hand? No? No? I mean, I, yeah, I mean, there are some dysfunctional family will teach their children to sin. But I'm very certain that none of us here will teach our children to sin. Amen? Now, how many of you parents still find your children sin in spite of the fact you didn't teach them to sin? Isn't that true? If you don't believe me, you turn to your neighbor right now, not yet, don't do yet, and you confess to them the ugliest thoughts, the dirtiest thoughts that came to your mind in the last one month. Some of you are like, oh, sure, you want me to do that? <laughs> you see, we all sin. Do you realize that? And sin separates us from God and breaks our peace with God. And because of that, Jesus has to come. And while Christmas, everybody sings carols and exchange gifts, Jesus has to come and die on the cross to restore our relationship with God. And so for the rest of us who are Christians, let us walk faithfully. And in this season, let us be grateful and thankful and continue to reach out. For some of us who have yet to know Christ, it's impossible for you to have peace unless you have peace with God first. And I pray, I pray before you leave this service, you will give your life to Jesus in order to establish your peace with our Father God. Amen. And now, let me, let me just talk about, uh, you know, the idea of peace of God, peace of God. You know, as I mentioned, peace with God is a one-time decision. Peace of God is a daily pursuit. The amazing thing is this, when you have peace of God, of course, you must have peace with God first. When you have this peace, you have peace with others. And, you know, joyful people are peaceful people. Isn't that true? Joyful people are hopeful people. They, they, are, they don't hold grudges. They, don't, they are not bitter. They can be offended by people, but they forgive easily. They let go, and they don't keep their offense. They, they just are joyful. They're just joyful, and they have peace with other people. Not only that, they have peace with themselves. You know, it's an exercise I love to get my students to do, um, you know, in counseling training. 
I said, when you go back tonight, go back home tonight, uh, especially for guys, you know, guys may not necessarily be doing that, but, um, you know, most ladies will clean up your makeup and all this, and you'll be looking into the mirror. But t- tonight, when you go back, or, you know, whatever time you go back home, uh, when you look in the mirror, ask yourself this, do you have peace with yourself? Do you have peace with yourself? Because some of us, we look at the mirror and it's like, oh man, I'm a failure. Oh man, my marriage is gone. Oh, you know, and it, you know, it's all uh, things that drive you to have no peace. No peace. But joyful people, hopeful people, peace-loving people, tonight when they look at the mirror and they see, wow, what a gorgeous guy. What a gorgeous guy. And, uh, and they, they are just hopeful. They are always joyful. And so do that tonight as you look in the mirror. I hope you see Christ in the mirror tonight. So, you know, people with peace with God and the peace of God, you have peace with other people and they have peace with themselves. So what peace really is, two components, um, there's peace with God and the peace of God. Now, the question is, how do we pursue this peace? How do we pursue this peace? This is where I gave you the big idea just now. Pursue peace through works of righteousness and pursue righteousness by becoming a peace Maker. And you say, wait a minute, what, what, what is this uh, works of righteousness all about? And what is this about uh, you know, becoming a peacemaker in order to have the peace of God? And let me uh, explain to you. First, p- pursue peace through works of righteousness. Isaiah 32 verse 17, it says, The work of righteousness will be, will be what? Peace. The work of righteousness will be peace. Peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. And forever means forever. And the pursuit of the peace of God by working of that righteousness gives us peace. Now, what is righteousness? Righteousness is anything and any condition that is acceptable to God. It's just so plain. The works of righteousness are things that will please God. Things that are aligned according to His will. In other words, when you are walking in line with God's word and His will, you are working the works of righteousness. And so you ask, how do I then work through this work of righteousness? How? This is where I want to give you the idea by becoming a peacemaker. By becoming a peacemaker. And I will show you scripture verses why this too is so important in order for us to have a divine, real peace in our life. And it's this con- continuous pursuit will give us a peace that it does not matter what happened around us, we will have that peace. In fact, there was a competition that went on, uh, an art competition, and they, they told all the artists to draw a picture to uh, resemble peace. And so, you know, many of the artists start to paint beautifully. Some paint a beautiful park with swans swimming. Uh, and, you know, seemingly some children were running around and uh, couples lying on the field having a picnic. That was peaceful. And in other words, it was a beautiful scene of a waterfall coming down and uh, birds was flying across it. And it was so beautiful, uh, so serene and so peaceful. And then they came uh, to the third picture. And it was they were startled by it because in the third picture, it was a picture of a thunderstorm. In fact, the wind was so strong that the tree bent over. It was so, so scary. In fact, the, the, the whole picture was very dark and, um, you know, dirt and dust was kicked up in the air and, you know, and, and you, can, you can almost feel that it is impossible to find peace. But yet, right at the middle of that picture was a little hut. And inside that hut was a candle. And beside the candle was a creep. And inside the creep was a baby, sleeping soundly. And so the judge asked him, what, what do you mean by, what, I mean, what do you mean? And the, this artist said, look, if you find peace with environment that requires, uh, you know, to generate that kind of peaceful or serenity, that is not true peace. A true peace is only found when the whole world caves on you, but yet inside of you stands strong and firm. What a beautiful picture. 
Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And many of us have attended conferences and seminars about the kingdom, talking about the kingdom, talking about us as kingdom people. Now, very good and well, but you must understand, Jesus did not stop there. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 33, that seek ye first the kingdom of God and His, what? Righteousness. And His righteousness. And then, when we do that, all things shall be added unto you. You know, when you operate the Word of God half, you will never have anything and everything added unto you unless you have the fullness and you have the whole. In other words, you want the kingdom of God to be established in your life, in your family, in your workplace, in this nation, in the country, and in the country afar. Look, you need both. The kingdom of God and His righteousness. You need both this component itself. Psalms 85 verse 10, Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Isn't that beautiful? What a beautiful verse. And I encourage you to memorize it. Psalms 85 verse 10. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Friend, you want to find peace in your life? First, those of you who are not Christian, establish the peace with God by accepting Jesus in your life. And for us who are Christ followers, we have established that peace with God. Let's continue to pursue the peace of God. How do we pursue the peace of God? By doing, you know, pursuing peace through the works of righteousness. Now, let me give you the second part. How do we pursue the works of righteousness? By becoming a peacemaker. Now, let me explain to you first what peacemaker is not. What a peacemaker is not. A peacemaker is not a peacekeeper. I remember when I was in Israel and uh, the tour bus was passing by a huge, you know, a plane of a field. And uh, of course, we, we are not familiar what kind of uh, vegetation they are planting and all that. And then I saw right middle there, there were a truck put there, UN, right? UN. You know why is that, right? The peacekeeping troop, uh, United Nations peacekeeping troop. And uh, I asked the tour guide, you know, what, 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 what is all this? And they said, oh, this is uh, marijuana. The whole field of marijuana itself. Um, and I look at it, it's like, uh, there's not much peace for me. <laughs> Looking at the huge landscape, you know, of marijuana planted there. Uh, and United Nations is right there and there. Friend, we are not called to be peacekeeping, keep peacekeeping troop. Blessed are the peacemaker, not peacekeeper. Because peacekeeper does not concern themselves about solving the problem, but they concern themselves in just keeping peace there and there. They just sweep things under the carpet. As long as there's peace, that's fine, because that's their main objective. They are not there to solve the problem. But a peacemaker is not satisfied and will not rest until the issue is solved. Let me give you an illustration. Years ago, when my youngest son was still very young, uh, uh, we brought him uh, together, you know, go window shopping. And, and uh, you know, as a little child, they saw toys, right? He saw these toys and he started uh, want, wanting the toy. Mom, Dad, I want to buy. Mom, Dad, I want to buy. And uh, that certainly created a lot of, uh, you know, turmoil in us because there's no peace. He just keep disturbing and disturbing. And, but... Uh, uh, there's something, a precious lesson I learned from my wife. My wife say no. And when my, my wife say no, means no. And, you know, throughout, you know, we decided to go home and we, we, we went back to, you know, Singapore. It's called MRT, right? The train that, you know, that moves around the city. Um, and we went to the MRT. He still, I want to buy, I want to buy, and I want to buy. And uh, my two older kids was with us. And so my wife looked at them and they are slightly older, quite independent. So my wife say, Two of you, go home first. I was hoping that she say, you also go home. <laughs> but she said, you sit down. I said, okay, I sit down. <laughs> Blessed are the peacekeeper. I almost wanted to be a peacekeeper. Okay, la, buy, la, buy. La. You know? <laughs> if, imagine if I buy for him, I will have temporal peace. I, became, I will become a peacekeeper. You, you get the idea? But my wife is not satisfied to be a peacekeeper. She... She is a peacemaker. And so she told her, the son, no. Ah, I scream louder. And by the time, you know, people are looking at us. And you know, we men, uh, somehow we get embarrassed easier than ladies. And they say, oh man, 
Is there a hole? Can I put my head in? You know, <laughs> everybody is staring at us, and I'm so embarrassed. And and you know, I, I used to tell people this. Uh, by the way, that MRT is Dobby God, Dobby God. And uh, my son literally mopped the floor. You know what that means, right? He was rolling on the floor. I want a toy. Oh man, he was helping them to mop the floor. I should send a bill to MRT. And my wife just said no. I was like, oh, I was dying inside, you know. Oh, never mind, lah. let him. Lah. You see the, the eyes of that couple looking at us now. You know, people walk past, it's like, what kind of parent is this? You can't even control your children. I mean, we're hopeless parents. You know, everybody walks around and look at us like this. But my wife wants to be a peacemaker. So she said no. And you know what? You try to roll on the floor many times. You get tired, right? So he got tired, he stood up. So my wife said, ready to go home? Yeah. So we brought him home. <laughs> since then, since then, blessed are the peacemaker. My son, sometimes he will still ask, can I have that toy? When we say no, he just show face. You know, he stopped throwing tantrum. You, you get the idea? You know, some of us parents, our children scream and make noise and, I want to play phone, I want to play phone. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Peace, oh, peace. Then next moment you go home, you get, do you know how long you've been on the phone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But wait a minute. Because parents, sometimes we are the peacekeeper. In many occasions, we give in to them. We allow them. And therefore, at the end of the day, what happened? They become addicted. In fact, a sidetrack, right? Just uh, last week, there was a report uh, in the news. This mother was so fed up with his 13-year-old son, he decided to ban him from his handphone for one year. Any of you read that news? And the, the result after that one year, within that one year period, was remarkable. She discovered that the son became more alive, more attentive. His grades went up. And not only that, he even offered to do housework. Man, I want to ban everything at home. <laughs> Blessed are the peacemaker, my friend. So how do we have peace? How do we have divine peace? Peace with God, accept Jesus into your life, but pursue the peace of God by pursuing the works of righteousness. And how to have the works of righteousness by becoming a peacemaker. The other, what peacemaker is not, it's not a peacekeeper, neither is it a peacebreaker. Now, I trust that none of us are peace breaker here. And I will say this to all of you. If there are any peace breaker that come into this auditorium, rebuke them in love. But if you refuse to repent, shake off your dust, say bye-bye to them. Okay, I'm serious about this because, the, you know, God himself opposes the proud and give grace to the humble peace Breakers are the most arrogant and prideful people that you can think of. In fact, you write down in, you know, in your Bible, I encourage people to memorize this in uh, Proverbs 6, 16 to 19. This is a very important verse. You want to please God? Proverbs 6, 16 to 19 tells you what God hates. You know, Proverbs 6, 16 to 19. And you just work contrary to that. You know, uh, 16, the, uh, uh, the Lord hates and 7, detestable to Him. Uh, haughty eyes. Haughty eyes is about prideful people. Lying tongue. Hand that shed in, uh, heart that divides wicked sin. Hand that shed innocent blood. Feet that quit to rush for evil. You know, a, a false weakness that speak lies. And uh, the one that sow discord among brethren. Can you imagine a person that come and sow discord among brethren? God says, I hate you. So do, let's not be a peace breaker. Let's not be a peace breaker. Let's come in and be thankful. That's why peace-loving people are the most joyful people. You know, maybe the aircon broke down and it's like, oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Today we can have warm fellowship. And maybe it's too cold. Oh, so nice, I can hug you. 
And they, they would just be joyful about everything, you know. Maybe, maybe they don't look very good in their face and, and uh, they go back home and they look at the mirror, you know. For some of us, if with that look, we look at the mirror, we, whoo, we, we, we fainted, you know. Get a fright with our own look. But then he would look at the, the mirror and, you know, where there's nothing else to give thanks, he give thanks for the mirror. Oh, God, thank you for the mirror, you know. Even though my face is not fantastic, but I thank you <laughs> anyway. Joyful people are peaceful people and that inspire hope in their lives. So remember, peacemaker is not a peacekeeper, neither is this person a peacebreaker. James 3, 17 and 18 says, But wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceful, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, uh, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Peacemaker who sow in peace, guess what happened? Reaps harvest of righteousness. You see, when righteousness and peace come together, they kissed. Psalms 85 verse 10. And when these two come together, friend, we become a peacemaker. That's why Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemaker, for they shall be called the sons of God. And if you are a peacemaker today, you turn to your neighbor and say, I'm the son or I'm the daughter of God. You know, why wouldn't you do that? Turn to your neighbors and say that. Yeah. Let me give you some um, illustration how a peacemaker looks like. I've shown you what a peacemaker is not, but what a peacemaker looks like. Number one, a peacemaker accepts what we cannot change and change what we can. You know, sometimes we go through lives painful. You know, the best thing in Malaysia is I know everybody drives. Everybody drives in Malaysia. Uh, my children drive too. They drive me up the wall. <laughs> right, Malaysian drive. Let me ask you a question. Do you drive home looking at your rear mirror? Any of you drive home using your rear mirror? No? No, right? No. All of us drive looking forward. We only look at the rear mirror to reverse, to do our parking, or sometimes, you know, go to a wrong lane, we go back. And you see, the problem is when we cannot accept what we cannot change in about our past, we are driving our life looking at the real mirror. Friend, every time when you look back in your life, there may be some of us, you know, I've come across people, uh, very painful past, abusive parents, uh, daughters being raped by father, I have people who uh, are grown in a divorced uh, parent's family, um, some are being abandoned and what have you, and some suffer failure in their marriage. You know, maybe some of us, you have a very bad relationship with your husband or your wife and end up in divorce. And these are your past. Um, and maybe some of you are still going through that now. But my friend, you don't go through life by, you know, looking at the real mirror. The only thing you want to do when you look at the real mirror about your past is to turn that stumbling block into a stepping stone. The devil used it to destroy you you use it to step on it and go higher. Amen? And so let's accept what we cannot change and change what we can. That's how a peacemaker looks like. The peacemaker will look at the past and say, I will not allow that to rob me of all my peace and my joy and my hope. But today, I purpose in my heart, I'm going to be a peacemaker. And how am I going to be a peacemaker? I will accept what I cannot change, but I change what I can. That's why I know of this uh, very dear godly woman who's a great grandmother today. She was raped brutally when she was growing up. But today, guess what? As a great-grandmother for years, she has been going around helping women who has been raped. That, that is the call of her ministry. She did not let her past become a stumbling block, but she has turned her past to a stepping stone. So how a peacemaker look like? A person who accepts what we cannot change and change what we can. Number two is believe in God. Believe in God. Now, granted, I know many of us go through life, sometimes it's tough. You trust the Lord, and yet, you know, time and time again, before things can end, and other things hit you. I remember, you know, we went uh, to a mountain tribe um, in northern Thailand. Um, and, you know, after doing some ministry, the, the, because of the rain that was on for the last uh, few days, when I was coming down uh, on the slope, I tripped and I fell and I started rolling down the hill. And can you imagine? It's like you try to grab all you can, but you just can't grab anything. The only thing I can grab is mud. 
and dirt. And because of that, you know, I just keep rolling down. And by the time I reached, you know, my whole hair, whole, uh, you know, body was uh, dirt and mud and, you know, it's just terrible. And to make matter worse, uh, I got difficulty getting out because, you know, it was very soft and uh, I was literally like, you know, submerged into the water and mud and I was having a hard time because it was soft. I couldn't get up. And as if that's not enough, the villagers all came out and they laughed. <laughs> Friend, I tell you, if you were me lying there, you don't laugh. You want to cry. You say, oh man, God, what am I going to do? From head to toe, I'm filled with mud. Isn't that true for some of us in your life? That you try your best to just keep up the good spirit, but before you knew it, you start rolling down the hill again. But you try to pick yourself up, and before you knew it, people around ridicule you. You know what? Believe in God anyway. Believe in God anyway. Purpose in your heart right now. Believe in God anyway. You know, guess what happened? After that, I managed to pull myself and I stood up. Can you imagine? This is a mountainous area with all the tribal people with no electricity except a little bit of you know, solar panel. They just give them a little bit of light. It's a very, very you know, arcade place. When I stood up, I saw a tap right in front of me. And I showered in front of everybody that morning. And this time they look at me, they smile. Friend, when things are getting back for you, say, God, no matter what, I'm going to be a peacemaker. And as a peacemaker, I will never let the devil come and disrupt. For me to live is Christ. To die is gain. To die is gain. So believe in God anyway. Third, cultivate love. Cultivate love. You know, the, the thing that the devil wants to do is to take us out of ministry, remove us out from church. And um, let's do a quick survey here again. Um, you know, all of us who have been in church long enough, how many of you agree with me that somewhere or another, you will get hurt. Can I see your hand? You will get hurt, no matter what. Right? Yeah? Some of you long enough, you'll never get hurt. I will work for you. Those of you who have been hurt by church, congratulations. Good for you. How else can you learn love unless you face someone, not like me, I mean, I'm so lovable, right? Face someone that is very unlovable. Right? When you face someone that's very unlovable, of course, you know. But that's how. How else can you learn to forgive unless someone hurt you and you yet you still choose to forgive? That's why no matter what, a peacemaker will constantly cultivate love. You know, some of you young ladies, the guys don't want you anymore. So let's separate. Let's, let's cut off the relationship. Hey, why cry? I mean, yeah, painful. Then I might cry a while. Then after that, not worthy of my love. Redirect your love. Channel your love So somewhere else. I mean, at least you see many of us here, look around you. Many of us here are lovable people. Redirect your love. You know, yes, uh, I was just uh, sharing that when my wife was uh, walking around in Aeon and uh, in the speaker, they were playing this song and I have permission from Pastor Mike to sing some secular song. Uh, because it's Christmas time and uh, the song that was airing last Christmas I give you my heart the very next day you gave it away this year can you help me brother <laughs> I give it to someone special hey look if the person judged you look redirect your love continue to cultivate love don't waste time on that fella kick him out you know this Christmas give your love to somebody else who is special especially Jesus amen amen so stay engaged my friend a peacemaker will never disengage but will always always stay engaged let me go through a summary of the whole sermon again. I started off by saying, how to, how to have peace? How to have peace? We say Jesus came to bring us peace. First, we talk about there are two components, P 
peace with God. That is established when we accept Jesus as our personal Savior and Lord. And then the peace of God is a continuous pursuit. The how to pursue this peace is by pursuing the works of righteousness and how to establish the works of righteousness in our life by becoming a peacemaker. And I said a peacemaker is not a peacekeeper, neither is he a peacebreaker. And a peacemaker is a one that will accept things that they cannot change and change what they can. A peacekeeper will always choose to believe God no matter what. A peacekeeper will continuously cultivate love and instead of being disengaged, they will continue to engage in their life. Friend, pursue peace through works of righteousness and pursue righteousness by becoming a peacemaker. You know, I will end off with this story in, in a remote island in Philippines. It was in a jungle called the Luban Island. Some of you may have heard of this island. There was this young Japanese soldier fighting during the Second World War and will receive a, an order, a command from his commander saying that you are not to surrender. And so he fought the war bravely and courageously but the problem is, is this, he lost every communication and he was left alone in that war. Most of his comrades, either you know, they missed each other and they, they lost their way from each other or they died in the war. And he was left alone. And holding on to that command of not uh, to surrender, he continued to persevere in Luban Island for a total of 29 years. The problem is 29 years ago, before he was found, the war was over. So for 29 years, he thought that what the war was still going on. He was maneuvering and he would catch whatever he can eat, drink whatever water he can find. And he was in this island almost for three decades, thinking that the war is still ongoing until someone who was hiking the area and found him and told him that, sir, the war is over. But he still refused to believe until his own personal commander flown in to Luban Island to announce to him, please come back to Japan. The war is over. It's over 29 years ago. Friend, when Jesus came, He came to give us peace. He came to tell you and I that when He came, He has established peace on earth because when He hung on the cross, He broke all darkness. He broke all power from the devil and they destroy all death and all battle that you and I will never be able to fight but he has won the battle my friend in, in that sense I'm telling you this the battle is won war is over the war is over if you have peace if you have peace in Jesus you will understand what it means that the war is over that the victory already won. Friend, many of us today, you may look at your life and it's like, what, what do you mean by won? I'm still battling a health issue. I'm still battling a financial issue. My relationship with, with my husband or my wife or my children is still no good. And my work is still having a lot of problems and all this. Rise up. Pursue the works of righteousness by becoming a peacemaker. And when you choose to do that, you guess what happened? The prince of peace is in your heart. And when you have Jesus, the battle is won, no matter what. Shall we all stand? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you. We want to thank you. I don't care whether Christmas is December or some call in September or in March. But I don't care in a sense, Lord, not that it's not important, but that's not the most important, but it's most important that Jesus, you came. You came. And today I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you let all my brothers and sisters know, no matter what situation that they are in, that they may not have peace, but let them know, God, you came for them. You came to establish peace. Not the peace that the world can give, but the peace that is in Jesus. And therefore, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus, God, that let every of their anxious heart, Lord, be subdued under the Prince of Peace. And that they, Lord, will not be anxious, but learning, Lord, to do everything in prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving. 
And for that, God, knowing that the Prince of Peace, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts to steal our soul, to give us a peace, a strength, and a mind of Christ. And so that we will overcome all temptation, over all weaknesses, and to establish that true peace that can only be found in Jesus. Lord, bless all my brothers and sisters this Christmas that apart from themselves, they will rise beyond themselves. I thank you for Church of Praise that has worked hard all these years in laboring. And God, this Christmas is a special time that they even open house to the neighbours, to all communities here. And I pray, God, that all my brothers and sisters will begin to see that we are called to be peacemakers. And a peacemaker do not look at our own lives alone, but to look at the people around us, to know that many of them out there are without peace because they are not even having a peace with God. And they need the salvation through Jesus. And so, God, I pray that you burden our hearts, Lord. And that's a good burden. Burden our hearts for soul. That today we are purpose in our heart that we will be a peacemaker. We are no longer to be a, to shy or afraid, Lord, to invite our family members, our loved ones, our colleagues, our friends. God, a peacemaker will never be afraid of being rejected. But we will step forth, Lord, and to say, will you come for our Christmas service? Will you come for our uh, uh, Christmas Eve service? God, I pray for courage. I pray, God, that they will say, I don't care. But as a peacemaker, I'm going to invite. Even if they don't come, I will still invite. I will still invite them to come. So I pray, God, just fill their hearts, Lord, that you will inspire them. Inspire them, Lord, that they will seize every opportunity, especially this season, especially this evening, they are going for caroling. Lord, bless them with great weather. Bless all of them with protection, with journey mercy, with great voices that sing like angels, Lord. And your angels, hosts of angels will join them. But more importantly, God, cause the people here, Lord, to invite friends, to support their fellow brothers and sisters who are in the front line reaching out. But they themselves, all of you, will also reach out, Lord. And also, God, I pray that this week, Lord, they will go back and begin to list down the names of people that they will invite. And every day, Lord, I pray as a peacemaker in the name of Jesus, every day they will pray for this name, Lord, to invite, Lord, so that they, they will see them come for Christmas service or the Christmas Eve service, Lord. God, at the end of the day, you say in Matthew 5 verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for there we are qualified to be called the sons and the daughters of God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.